<laughs> Welcome to uh, day two of Qualtrics slash Excel week. Um, so my internet isn't great out here where I live. So if I start to sound weird, let me know and I'll turn my video off and see if that helps a little bit. So I kicked my kid off just now. So um, I have all the bandwidth in the house. So let's hope that does something uh, good. All right, so yesterday um, we heard from Debbie mostly. Um, we covered sort of Qualtrics basics as it relates to using the platform as a registration tool and kind of collecting um, qualitative information. So using text boxes and essay boxes and that kind of stuff to gather information. Today we're gonna to talk about um, using it more as a survey tool, as a kind of an evaluation tool. Um, we have three big topics to cover today. And as we alluded to yesterday, uh, each of these are huge. Um, so today, think of today as just kind of as a, as a primer. Um, we want to just kind of give you a glimpse of what's possible um, and then encourage you to kind of work on your own to get more well-versed in Qualtrics or to reach out to us to help you out with the survey. Um, again, Qualtrics, there's so much out there on, online um, to help you to learn the platform. Um, I, I, everything I've learned, I've learned pretty much looking it up, Googling it, watching YouTube videos, reading tutorials. Um, it's a really basic, easy platform to use. And um, so today we'll get into three things. One is a few different question types. Uh, we'll talk about kind of how to set those up with a, um, a focus on accessibility. Number two, we're gonna talk about how to distribute your survey um, primarily via email using a contact list and the benefits of that method. And then number three, we're gonna talk about really quickly how to use the reporting function in Qualtrics. So once you've collected all of your data, how do you package it up into a really nice Word doc, for example, um, to share it with stakeholders or county commissioners or educators or your boss or whoever it is. So let's get started. Um, all right, so let me share my screen so we can see what's going on. All right. Is everybody seeing uh, my screen and specifically PowerPoint? All right. So this is a slide from Debbie uh, uh, yesterday. Um, so accessibility, we are putting a, obviously a, um, we care about this, we're putting an emphasis on this and we're looking at question types and Qualtrics that are accessible um, versus non-accessible. So if you think about it, uh, these are question types in Qualtrics that are more friendly um, for software that might um, sort of be a, a, like an audio reader for somebody who might have difficulty seeing, for example. So um, on their computer, they have um, a program that, that, that can read questions uh, out to them and they can therefore respond to those questions. So on the accessible side, those are the ones that we want to use, obviously, to be in compliance and to, uh, to you know, bear in mind all of the, uh, all of the various citizens of Ohio that we have. Um, so we have things like descriptive text. Uh, multiple choice is super simple and easy to use. Um, some matrix is there, but that's sort of the really rare matrix type questions that we're not going to be using. Um, and then text entry and side by side, we'll show you today. If you notice over on the non-accessible side, the first one is those matrix questions. So we are going to be moving away from using matrix questions um, for sort of public facing surveys, but we'll show you some ways to ask those kind of questions and this will all make a lot more sense once we get into it. So let's go ahead and look at, um, Qualtrics. So I've already signed in. Um, in order to, for sort of speed today, I've kind of already pulled up some surveys and pulled up some samples. I'm already, I've already logged in. I've already kind of started this. So, uh, so here's a survey I created just for today, basically. Um, and we're kind of working on this idea of um, maybe this is a survey that you would send to um, people who came to your program, and you want to maybe you had three objectives for your for your class that day, and you want to find out if you met those objectives, or if your participants agree or disagree that you met those objectives. And that's gonna help you to maybe, maybe fine tune your teaching or fine tune your training to really get, um, get at the heart of what you wanted to, to know. So we'll show you a few ways to ask this question, basically. So we're calling these things objective one, objective two, objective three. 
Um, and we're using a five point scale today. So strongly disagree, strongly agree. It's all very standard, something that you might have done in paper or done in um, done previously. Um, so if we look at these things, so I've, I built these questions. One is a matrix, which, which is this right here. Um, this is a side by side. And then down here, we've done these as individual multiple choice um, questions. And we'll cover all three of those. But if we look at them, uh, so I hit the preview button to kind of see what it is that they look like, and we'll see what they um, what they come up as. So while that's coming up, let's talk about the basic in and outs of how to add a question to Qualtrics. Again, super intuitive, and um, we will start here. All right, so Qualtrics is set up, if you don't know, kind of as a series of boxes, right? Um, so each little question or each item or each title is its own little box with its own little um, its own little attributes. So to add a question, we're just gonna hit this green plus sign right here. And it kind of starts with this default multiple choice question. All right, just to read real quick. Okay, thanks Debbie. All right, I see the chat popping up over there. So I'm sure Debbie's on the chat responses. All right, so whenever you're clicked on a question right here, um, over here on the right side, um, automatically pops up all of your options for that question. And you can modify the question to however you want. Uh, the great thing about Qualtrics is nothing is ever final. So you can always kind of change it and then go right back to how you liked it before. Um, so it's a really nice, simple, safe way to edit questions. So let's see, we're gonna make this a multiple choice question about, um, well, let's see. Let's just get a general idea of how folks like the class. Um, and we can say, please rate today's class on a scale of one to 10. Something very simple. Um, and then we need to obviously change our choices. So we'll need more. We only have three. So if we go over here, um, we're showing three choices. We can just bump this up to 10. And let's make choice one a one. Make choice two a two, and so on. Um, luckily, Qualtrics is smart and it's recognizing what I'm doing, and it literally is auto populating all of these. So there you go. There's a question. Um, if you ever want to change these things, let's say we want to change the scale one to 11. Let's say we want an 11 point scale for some crazy reason. We'll need to add one, which we can go over here and do this, obviously, like I just showed you. Or if you want, you can click on the 10 and hit the return button and it immediately generates a brand new one for you. So super simple. Um, and again, there's no way to mess this up, right? Let's say I come over here by accident and I bump this down to like four. Oh no, you know, my question's ruined. No, you can just go right back up and it's gonna kind of know what you did. Um, this red minus symbol deletes a question. So let's say I hit that and it's disappeared. And you're like, oh no, where did it go? The great thing is Qualtrics always keeps questions down here in your garbage can. So here's your trash. And here, oh, here's this question that I just deleted by accident. It's way down here, let's restore that. And it's gonna put it right back up to where it was before. So again, you can't mess anything up in Qualtrics. You can always kind of go back to where you were. Uh, let's say I want this question last. I'm gonna use these little arrows right here up and down. And let's just bump it all the way down and make this the last question in our survey. So you can move this up and down. It's very tactile, it's very simple to use. And there it is down there. All right, so um, we'll take a look at that in a minute. But some other options you have on the right side. Um, so multiple choice. It defaults to single answer. So you can only choose one, one thing on the, on the list. Um, there are obvious times for multiple answer and you can obviously make that a multiple answer question. You can orient your choices in vertical, horizontal columns. Um, you know, let's say I make this a horizontal alignment. That looks pretty great, right? So on a desktop, that's gonna be a really nice option where you have these really nice wide choices. Um, on a mobile device, on a phone, for example, this is gonna look pretty awful. Uh, it's gonna stick out the side or it's gonna, it's gonna jam it and make it vertical and it's gonna look a bit, a bit cramped. 
So you always have to think about those as well. Um, all right, well, let's go back here and take a look at our preview. So this is previewing, before I add that last question, this is previewing um, our objective questions that we talked about earlier. So again, if you notice, this first one is a matrix table. Um, pretty standard, right? So objectives here, and then you have your scales here, and you would kind of come through and you would mark these um, however you needed to. Um, down here, this is set up as a side-by-side. -side. So if you notice here, um, it's looking pretty similar. There's a few differences. It's kind of smashed a little bit. The columns are a bit wider, but for the most part, um, it looks pretty similar and you answer it in pretty much exactly the same way. And then multiple choice, um, it gives you some more space, right? So each objective is its own question effectively. So you would come through and you could just hit these and to answer your questions. So it's three ways to get to the same type of data. And in the Excel export, these all look pretty much the same. So it doesn't really matter uh, when it comes to data analysis. All right, if you've never seen this before, this is the, the preview function. So when you build a survey, you always wanna preview it um, throughout your build to see what it looks like. On the left side of the screen is the desktop, what it looks like on a desktop machine. On the right side is what it looks like on a phone. So here is where things get a little bit um, tricky between these, these different types. So the matrix table, it took this horizontal alignment and it automatically converted it to be vertical, which is pretty cool. Um, so it made that decision for us because it knows how wide this is and it went ahead and did that. All right, the side by side. So looks pretty much the same on desktop, but on mobile, it's not doing that for us. So it makes the person scroll over to answer the questions. Um, Again, side by side is what we're going to be using going forward because it is accessible to screen readers. Um, but you can see on a mobile device, it's a bit less desirable. And then looking at multiple choice, it basically laid them out in a vertical orientation. But for the most part, they look pretty similar to what they do on the desktop, just looking vertical. All right, so that's the preview function. And let's look at quickly building all these different things. All right, so here's the matrix. Um, so if we go ahead and just add a new question and we'll go over here and it defaults to multiple choice, but when we hit this button, a whole world of, of question types open up. <laughs> um, so between, let's say Debbie and I, we've made hundreds and hundreds of surveys in Qualtrics. Um, we haven't touched most of these question types. Some of these are really specific um, and really not all that practical for what we do. So. As you can see, they've kind of grouped them into standard questions, specialty questions, and then some advanced stuff. So for the most part, we spend 99% of our time in sort of static content and standard questions. So we're gonna change this multiple choice to a matrix table. And we have all of these different options and you get nice previews when you hover over them. So the simplest one is a Likert single answer and it automatically kind of builds it out for you, right? So here's where your statements would go. Um, and here is where your scales would go. So for example, let's say we're making an evaluation about a, a training. Um, let's see. Please. Um, what's the following from today's training? And let's say you want to you wanted to learn about let's see the uh, let's see how to cater how was the food how was the um, the seating was it comfortable uh, how was the parking maybe you had to pay for parking or you had to walk very far um, so and again same thing here we have three choices but over here I can add as many statements as I want to or I can back those off and then scales you can also um, make those as many as you want to. Qualtrics also has built-in automatic scale points, which is a lovely feature. Um, oh, it's not letting me change those because I've already done a few things. Okay, great. Um, I've already put some dummy values in, so I can't let me do that. But this automatic scale points, um, it gives you all the usual options. Uh, agree to disagree, um, likely to unlikely, all those kinds of things, they're all stored in there. So let's say we wanna do um, great. 
okay and um, poor, right? So that's literally how you would do that. Um, if you want to add, let's say, oh, we need a fourth option. Let's go here and we'll say, you know, it's very poor. So again, very, it's very easy to manipulate and to change kind of on the fly. Um, and, uh, and it's good for, um, for, yeah, for editing and then kind of going back to what you had before. Okay, so that's a matrix style question. Um, again, accessibility wise, it's not great. And we should not really be using it for, um, for public facing surveys in the event that somebody that we are sending it to um, has a, um, a screen reader or some similar technology. What I do use matrix questions for is if um, we do a lot of paper surveys that come into our office and then we enter those at, at, our, at our desks essentially. So if I was entering a bunch of paper surveys with this question on them, I could set it up as a matrix style question for myself um, and be able to quickly enter data in a matrix style question. So while I wouldn't send this question uh, to participants, I could use this for myself um, or maybe if I had an assistant, um, a grad student, someone like that who would be entering data. Um, that's what I would use that for. All right, so let's talk about uh, multiple choice, because again, these are the easiest ones. So again, here are my examples down here. Uh, if we're going to add a new one, um, we can say, you know, what was the best part of today's training? And then you can literally just change these choices to whatever you want. Um, and you can say the food eating and a little bit of parking. Um, and the way it's set up right now is it's set up as a single answer, right? So they would get to choose one of those things. Um, let's say you wanted them to um, get to choose more than one. So you can say, I don't know, choose all that by. And you can then um, change this to a multiple answer. And now they're allowed to choose one, two, or three, or zero. Um, so yeah, you can, and then if I want to add another one, I could say um, nothing was good about today's training. So giving them an option for those kinds of things. All right. So again, that's multiple choice. Um, it's pretty foolproof. Um, you can make these all day long without, um, without, without any problem. All right, and the final one is a side-by-side. -side. So this is what it looks like. So as you notice, it looks very, very similar to the, um, to the matrix style question. So if we were to add a new side-by-side, -side, go up here, and again, once you get to them, there are a lot of different side, oh, there's only one different side by side, that's great. All right, so here's a default side by side question. Um, so you have statements and you basically have two columns. Um, so a column with answers and a column with answers. So in, I might use this question for like a retrospective post-test, pre-test, right? So it's a question that, it's a, a question that you would give to somebody on, on a post-test where they would rank themselves on something before the class started and then after the class started. So you could say, um, let's see, my knowledge of, I don't know, weeds. We'll say it's a master gardener class of some kind. Um, and this could be, this could be before the class. And this could be after the class. And then your answers could be, um, they had some knowledge, they had a lot of knowledge, and let's add a third in there. We'll say um, significant knowledge. And then we would do the same ones over here. Oh, forgot to add my water over here. Oh, two columns. Okay, yep. So again, hit return, and that gives you the new column. Um, and then significant. So again, this is a great way to, um, to build a pre-post. 
here. Three subjects that you could ask what they knew. Let's see, and then the question would be, please indicate knowledge before and after. Something like that, right? So we use these a lot. We use um, we use retrospective pretest post tests. Uh, it's a great way to get a baseline knowledge. You can then compare the after to to the before. All right. So um, this obviously has two columns. Um, if I wanted to create something like this, which is right above, um, I could then essentially take a column out, right? So if I remove a second column and I leave just one column, then I've basically created a post-test matrix style question using a side-by-side. -side. After today's class, and we change this to the after, and there we go. And then these things are all changeable. So you can pull this out a little bit, um, kind of give it some more space if you need to. So again, that is a side by side. Um, you basically create it exactly the same way as you would a matrix style question with a couple little modifications. So that can be used either as an actual side by side, or it can be used as essentially a matrix style question um, built as a side by side. So Brian, Katie asked the question um, with side by side data, what does the data look like when you, when it, how does the data show up? When you export I'm assuming it? you mean like in, an, in a report? So it looks like this. Um, so I threw in some dummy data just to kind of see what things look like. Um, so here is, all right, so, so columns R, S, and T. These are the matrix questions. So you literally get objective one, objective two, and objective three. These are, each row is a respondent. So person one, uh, this is their answers. Person two, this is their answers. And person three, these are their answers. So the major question looks like this. The side-by-side -side looks like this. And the um, multiple choice looks like this. They all look essentially the same. If you keep a two column side-by-side, -side, it will give you um, the before, and then it'll give you the after. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head if those are next to each other or if those are separated a little bit. Um, but on Friday, I'm going to deal with retrospective, pretest, post test, Excel data analysis. So uh, we'll talk about how to take the post test answer and compare it to the pretest answer to get um, maybe an improvement in knowledge or an improvement in behavior, those kinds of things. But yeah, great question. All right, one more thing I want to touch on briefly before we jump on to the next thing um, is the idea of display logic. Um, so display logic and skip logic are kind of two cousins that we can use to show questions to certain people and not other people based on who they are or based on what their answers were to previous questions. So let's say, um, this question that we created here about today's training. Um, let's say the survey goes out to a bunch of folks who are part of a, a coalition. Um, and we're going to see what they thought about today's training. So the first thing we're going to do is say, um, did you attend today's training? Because if they didn't attend, then we shouldn't ask them about what they thought of the food, the seating, and the parking, for example, right? So this would literally be yes, no, and we'll just stop right there. Yes and no. All right, so when they get the survey, if they answer yes, then we want them to be, be, be shown this question here about today's training. If they answer no, then we don't want this question to pop up. So we're going to uh, impose some logic on this question in order to, um, to have it show up or not. All right, so over here, I haven't gotten to it yet, but this little cog opens up a whole new world of options as well. 
Um, and in Qualtrics fashion, these options can be found also over here on the right side, way down the bottom. So the Qualtrics puts stuff in a few different places, which makes it nice. All right, so these are all different advanced options that you can get into, and they're all super useful, but we're gonna talk about display logic because that is, in my opinion, kind of the most useful and most commonly used. All right, so here's my question about food, seating, and parking. So I want this question to display only if the following condition is met. So uh, the question, did you attend today's training? If somebody answers yes. All right, so you're basically building a sentence. You're basically building this logical sentence. So it's gonna display this question about food, seating, and parking if anybody answered yes, if that person answered yes to the above question. Um, and then right here we have a little caveat have it show in page or somewhere else. I recommend that you use the in page function because then it pops up right below the previous question as opposed to opening an entirely new page to answer that question. And we'll go ahead and save that. And as you can see, we have a blue bar and it's telling me that this question has some display logic. And again, if I messed up, I can come over here and I can edit display logic or take it off. There's no, um, there's no permanency there. All right, so while we're here, why don't we hit preview and we will see, um, well, I guess we gotta publish it first and then we will preview it. And we'll see how display logic works and we'll see if I did it correctly. But again, it's great. Um, if you have different kinds of people, you have different kinds of questions you want to ask. So if you have a coalition that has, I don't know, partners from the public sector, the private sector, nonprofits, um, and you want to ask them all different kinds of questions, you can, you can send them to all different parts of your survey. All right, so here's my survey. The first question is, did you attend the training? Uh, if I hit no, then that's it. Nothing happens, right? If I hit yes, then the question pops up right below it. Oh, okay, I was there. So I'm gonna rate the food was great, the seating was great, parking was kind of poor because I had to walk really far, right? Um, so that is display logic, that's how it works. Um, it's a great way to, um, to shorten your survey and only show people questions that, that they would see. Back in the old days, we used to do stuff like, you know, if you attended the training, please answer the questions below, right? On paper, you would see something like that. But with Qualtrics, there's no reason for that whatsoever. You can use display logic all you want. Brian, do you think display logic might be a way to funnel people to like more mobile friendly questions if we put in, are you answering the survey on a mobile device or cool. a computer? Didn't, th didn't think about that. That's amazing, yeah. So um, great. So we usually ask them, we usually send them places based on kind of who they are or what their experience is or those kind of things as personal things. But that's a great uh, suggestion to send them to various versions of a survey that could be more, more mobile friendly. Um, but yeah, great. All right, so that was topic one. It took about half an hour. So we're gonna move on quickly to topics two and three and just give you a quick a glimpse into, um, into distributing surveys. All right, so if you're not familiar with it yet, get familiar with your library in Qualtrics. So up here on the right-hand side, you have your projects, which is your surveys, your contacts, and your library. So there's two ways to distribute a survey. One is an anonymous link that you basically would just copy and paste into like an email, for example. All right, so up here in distributions, when you click on that menu item, you will then get some options on what to do. So an anonymous link is one that anybody can click on if they have it. Um, unless, you, unless you set it up right, they can, they can click on it a bunch of times and take it a bunch of times. And you don't really know who's responding. If you have a group of people and you already have their email addresses and their names, uh, you can essentially put those emails into a contact list and send an email to those contacts right out of Qualtrics. And then you can track who has responded and who hasn't responded. 
and you can send reminders um, and send thank you emails automatically out of Qualtrics. Um, so, and everybody gets one chance. They get one, uh, one chance to, to take the survey or the evaluation or to vote or whatever it is. So if you have the emails of a group, then you should be doing this. So again, here's the anonymous link. It's gonna generate this big honking link. If you click on that, it opens the survey up and you can take the survey. But right under that is the email function and we're gonna compose an email. So this works just like Outlook essentially or Gmail. Um, you basically have a window where you are able to write an email in this box, uh, give it a subject, decide when you're gonna send it and decide who to send it to. It looks pretty much just like an email program. Um, and if you look down here in the body, this is the magic of Qualtrics. Um, it is going to immediately um, paste in a survey link uh, for each individual recipient. So each individual email address will get their very own survey link. That'll be unique. I'm all over my stuff. So you can track it. Um, and if somebody submits something and they messed up and they say, oh, Brian, I messed up. I meant to answer this to, to this question. You can say, oh, no problem, I'll go in and I can unlock your response. They, they can go and they can, they can update their response. Um, so it's a very powerful way to, to send these out. Um, so I could type my email in right here if I wanted to, um, or I could go to my library and I could pull an email in that I've already written. Um, and then again, contacts, um, over in your contacts um, library, you have, uh, you, can, you set up contact lists and that's where you go to them. So in my library, I have about five pages of different groups. So participants for different things, uh, attendees for in-services, uh, members for a community. Um, what else do I have? These are all groups that I had email addresses for and I went ahead and I just built a contact list and I can go and access them. Uh, yep, attendees for workshop, students, uh, a panel. Um, so yeah, so these are all contacts that I have built out already. So let's go look at those. Uh, let's go ahead and cancel my email. Go to my contacts. And again, this is pretty much um, pretty self-explanatory, but I will pull up a different uh, survey. Um, I, don't, I doubt Ed's on the call, Ed Lenz. Um, hopefully it's cool with this. <laughs> um, so I helped Ed send out a ballot um, for an organization that he works with to vote for some awards. And we had obviously had emails of members and we sent this ballot to uh, the membership list, uh, which was great because every member got one vote um, and then that's it. They couldn't vote for, they couldn't vote more than once. They couldn't ballot stuff, they couldn't cheat, all those kind of things, not, not that they would. So we sent, um, we sent the email uh, with the contact list out to his membership. And this is kind of a, a history of what happened, right? So 87 members, uh, we, used, we, we put all 87 into a contact list and I wrote a nice email that said, or Ed wrote the email that said, hey everybody, please vote. And they all got their own link. Um, and we sent it out on December 5th um, and we had 70 people take the survey or finish the survey. Uh, we had a few that, again, a few that closed the survey without actually voting, so I had to kind of reopen them. Um, so they, they were able to actually take the survey. Um, but after, let's see, that was the fifth. Um, on the 10th, so five days later, I sent a reminder message. So I sent a reminder message to the folks who had not voted yet. And Qualtrics knows who's voted and who hasn't voted. And so it sent it just to those people who had not responded yet. So that was great. All right, so back to my contacts. So here is my contacts library. And here are all my different folders, all my different contact lists. And here are how many members are in each one. So if I want to, here's this green bar and I can go ahead and I can just create See, we'll call it training test group. And you start basically with a blank workbook. So I could literally input folks manually, type in your email, your first name, and your last name. Um, I, if I had a whole bunch of them in an Excel file, I literally just drop it right in here and it uploads all of them automatically. Um, if you wanna get fancy, you can import them from a survey. 
So you can send a survey out to people asking for their email addresses and their names, and then take the results of that survey and immediately create a contact list out of that survey. So it's a bit more advanced, but it's possible. And then once you have a contact list built, you can send, uh, you can send your email to that group. All right. So that is that. Um, let's look at libraries again. So again, your library is where, yeah. Is there a question? The goal um, of, you know, you sending to um, individual email addresses uh, and using a uh, test um, is so that we can ask as well. If you already know the data, then you shouldn't ask the question. Know their first name and last last name and email address, then you really don't need to ask the questions on the survey then. Um, yeah. You can just include. You were going to All library. Right. Library. So Debbie's Sorry. breaking up for me a little bit. Um, but yeah, so Debbie, you broke up for me a little bit, but good stuff there. Um, always preferential if you have email addresses to just send the survey. Um, and if you want to, you can actually put a bunch of other data into that contact list, like what their job title is, where they work, what their address is, what their zip code is. Um, and you can, you can get really specific if you want to, like just sending, you know, if you just want to send uh, emails to certain groups or certain zip codes or certain counties, or if you want to analyze the data based on that. So if you send a survey out, um, and you've got, I don't know, years employed by extension in there, you can then analyze your results based on, um, you know, if they're a new employee or a veteran or a middle career kind of person. So those contact lists can really be like spreadsheets with a bunch of data uh, embedded in the back, but that's a whole nother, a whole nother day. So Brian, uh, so, yeah. Uh, Question, um, Kay wants to know, does Quadrix let you know if one of the email addresses is no longer active or bounces back? Yeah, so if you saw that, um, so here, uh, this is the membership we emailed out to. Um, it tells you kind of right here. So um, if you open that email, if you open this menu up, uh, you get bounced surveys, duplicate e emails, those kind of, or emails bounced, duplicate emails, those kind of things. Um, uh, and then how do you find, I think you can then download this distribution and it's going to tell you which one's bounced and which ones are duplicates and that kind of stuff. I've not done that before, but you're, you're able to, um, to export your distribution to look at the details. Um, and I'm you can download the that, history. You can download the history and it'll, 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 I'm almost positive it'll tell you which one's bounced. But yeah, great, great question. And Brian, right. does yeah. when you and I can't remember when you upload a contact list, um, yeah. does it can it be in Excel or does it have to be CSV? Ooh, great question. Um, I can't remember. I don't know off the top of my head. Neither, Debbie. Uh, you remember? Um, you it'll, can use. It'll tell you. you can use either a CSV or an Excel file. Now, Excel. Wonderful. You. All right, so um, to recap, I'm up here in my library. Um, in your library, you have, uh, it's where you keep your surveys, obviously. You can keep graphics. Um, Qualtrics defaults to having OSU branding on it, which is very nice. But if you needed special graphics, you could hide them in there. Um, any files you might need to attach to a survey, you can put in there. Um, but the real one you're gonna use is the messages library. This is where you keep all of your, your emails um, and those kind of things. So there's a few different kinds. Um, you're gonna write emails to invite folks to take a survey. That's gonna have those links in there. You're gonna write reminder emails, which would be a little bit different um, to remind them to do that. And you can create your own end of survey messages, which is great. So Qualtrics kind of defaults to like, thanks for your response. You, you know, it's been noted, have a great day or whatever it says. But if you want to, you can make a custom message that, that someone gets like, Thanks for voting in this poll. Uh, results will be announced on this date. So you can make it really personal for folks. All right. 
So just to go back real quick, um, so that's where all that stuff lives. So, you know, you can create a new message. So if I know I'm going to send a survey out, I will open this up. I will type my email in here and I will save it. And then when I go to distribute it, I will go and I'll find that basically. So let's go ahead and go back to my project. And I don't want to miss the last reporting part. So I might jump over to that real quick while this is coming back. All right, so reports. Um, reports are tremendous. Um, so two main ways to deal with your data. One is to export it to Excel, which we're going to work on Thursday and Friday with Debbie and I. Um, if you're good at Excel and you have some more advanced analysis to do, then that's perfect. You can get, you, you can you can you can do that. Um, however, Qualtrics has a incredibly robust reporting system built into it, and you can use it to make really quickly, really like really nice reports. Um, and I'm going to walk you through some of the basic features of that real quick. Um, so again, up here in your menu, you have a report function, um, and it opens up your all of your survey data so not to confuse you but i pulled up an old um, um it's from a couple years ago actually no this has all the data in it. Uh, million hearts million hearts is a program that uh fcs educators and others teach um, and we do a pre-survey and a post-survey for that program um, and here is some data from um from the post survey and this has data from multiple counties and multiple years in it like 2015, 16, 17, 18, and 19. Um, and so I, let's say I want to do a report on one county for one year, and I wanted to have some basic information to share. So here's how you would do that. Um, so the great thing is, so here are all the questions um, that this program, uh, that we asked them. So things like, uh, you know, which of the following foods have high levels of sodium? Um, over the past month, how often did you use heart healthy oils, use herbs and spices? So this is the survey that we use um, to collect the information. And what it does automatically is Qualtrics takes all that data that's been submitted and it begins to put it into summary tables and graphs for you. Um, and it's up to you about how you want those to look and what you want to show or not show in your report. Um, so for, well, okay, so this, um, this survey has uh, 55 responses in it. And, but again, that's a bunch of counties in a bunch of years, um, and I don't want to show all those. So I'm going to go to this filter feature. So filters are how you uh, basically select the data that you want to see. Um, and I added a filter on here earlier today. Uh, and here's what it is. So again, much like display logic, you're basically creating sentences. So I wanted to show only responses where the county is Wood County and the recorded date is after 1-15-2019. Um, one fifteen, of course, being the, uh, the deadline for VITA submissions, right? So uh, we have folks, not that Wood County would do this, but we have folks who enter data like right up to the, you know, that date. So anything that was entered after 115 is effectively a program that took place in 2019, based on how I set this up. So any any entry, any response that's in the survey that's from Wood County that was entered after this date is going to show up in my data right now. And so over in this gear, we can see that um, there's this many total uh, responses. And there are 23 from Wood County from last year. So all the data that I'm seeing is um, from Wood County from last year. So I'm basically gonna make a report and I'm gonna send it to Wood County and I'm gonna say, hey, here's what, here's what your Million Hearts program was like last year. All right, so here's the thing though. Every single question is gonna show up. Um, and then I need to see every single question, right? So number one being participant code. So every participant gets a code so we can match up their pretest with their post-test. Um, they don't need to see that in a post-test, right? So I'm gonna basically hide this. So over here on the left side is your menu for all your different questions. And you get a little checkbox. And if I uncheck that, then that page will not appear on my report, which is great. 
All right, class date. Oh man, all these class dates. I have the list of class dates. I'm going to turn that off too. Uh, let's see, Wood County. They're all from Wood County, so that's kind of silly to have that show up. So that's going out too. All right. All right. So now we get into some of the actual questions. Awesome. So here are here's a question. Um, high levels of sodium. Here are the responses, and here are um, people's people's answers. So again, this is the post test. So you're hoping that they did pretty well, and it looks like based on the right answers that they did a pretty good job. Um, and I, I'm keeping that. Um, I'm keeping this one. I'm keeping most of the rest of them. Um, now, if I want to modify this table, um, then all I need to do is click on it, and you'll see on the right side a menu pops up. So here's the menu for this table from this question, right? Um, so let's see, what can I do? I can change the decimal places, right? Two is too many. I don't like two. I'm going to do it with one decimal place. All right, I like that a little bit better. Um, you can do all kinds of advanced stuff, like breakouts by other questions, but don't worry too much about that. Um, let's see, do I want percentages? Let's see if I could, yeah, okay, let's add those. That's kind of, that's kind of a nice thing to have. I could take some questions out, um, or out, choices out if I wanted to, but that's kind of, kind of strange. Um, uh, but then right here, I have options for what this looks like. So right now it's a table. But if I wanted to say a bar chart, I would click on that and it would turn into a bar chart. So it's thinking, it's thinking, it's retrieving data. There you go. Not a very dramatic bar chart, but it's a bar chart. Um, you could say oh, the other ones, all right, pie chart. We'll see what that looks like just for Debbie because she likes pie charts so much. Um, so there, that, that's kind of a nice looking pie chart, but the table's better, back to the table. Um, let's say I want a table and a pie chart. So let's go ahead and add a visualization down here. All right, it added a visualization, it defaulted to bar chart, but I'm gonna change that to pie chart because I like pie charts. And now I have a table to go with a pie chart. That's pretty nice. All right, I'm gonna go with that. And from here, you can change all this stuff too. You can change decimals and you can change labels, you can change colors, you can change whatever you wanna do uh, and play with it as much as you want. All right, so if we go back down through here, um, yep, just more questions. Um, questions on diet, questions on exercise. Um, yeah, this is a nice table here. So we have what they've done over the last month and we have a frequency table. Um, that's pretty cool, but let's say I wanna see this in a, in a, in a visualization. So let's go ahead and add a visualization. Let's see what it looks like. Oh, that's kind of nice. Um, but what it's done, all right, so it's giving me, here are my three questions, and it's grouping them by the frequency. That's okay. Um, but let's say, let's see over here. Let's, oh, transpose. Here we go. There's a nice option down here called transpose. So that's going to take the choices and the frequency and it's going to switch their positions. All right. So now here's the first question, second question, third question based on the frequency. This I like a lot better because I could talk about each one of these questions um, kind of separately. So I'm going to keep that as a visualization. Um, and then, all right, here's an open ended question. So, what have you done to reduce the amount of sodium in your diet? So people are typing in their responses. And these are all in here. Um, so this is a lot of stuff, right? Um, if I were to give this to an educator, I would leave all this stuff in there because they can read the responses of, of the participants and that's great for them. If I was sending this to say a county commissioner, I don't know, I might not put all these in here. I might pull one of them out and make it like a highlighted quote or something like that. So let's go ahead and maybe turn that one off. That'll be, that'll be dark. All right, and there's more questions, obviously. So as you can see, um, you can really customize this report to kind of get it to what you want it to be. And now, how do you share it? Over here is the share menu, and you have a lot of choices. Um, for me, what I typically do is I export it as a Word document, and then I make it a little bit prettier in Word before I share it with anybody else. So if we export it as a Word document, again, you're getting options about what you want to turn off and on, um, but we've already done all that. So now we're going to export it. 
and it's going to download in some amount of time and it's going to look nice and pretty in Word. So here we go. All right. Should show up in my downloads. So it comes out a little bit generic, um, but here it is. All right, so what I might do is maybe come in here and clean this up a little bit, take out the question numbers, right? Um, I could play with column width here in Word. I can move things around a little bit. Um, here's this really cool pie chart. Uh, that's on the same page, I like that a lot. So to go over to, oh wait, um, to show what this looked like, the, kind of in the end, um, here's kind of my final report to Wood County last year. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, we have a pre-test and a post-test for, for, for this program. Um, so I have a pre-survey and a post-survey, and then I export the data to, some of it, to Excel, and I match it pre-test and post-tests. So the end report had a table for the pre-test data, there it is, and then a table for the post-test data, right there with, with each other. So you could see from pre to post how folks improved their knowledge. And there you go, there's pre and post, there's pre and post. Um, and then at some point, so here's some knowledge gains. So we actually scored those questions. There was right answers and wrong answers and they got a score based on how they answered it. Um, and so here we were able to talk about, um, you know, uh, the, the average score in the pre-test was 16 and the post-test was 21. And hey, look, every single person increased their score from pre to post. That's very rare, but it happens. Um, and then here's our frequency tables, right? So here's our three questions, and here are the frequencies from never to almost always. And same thing here. Uh, here's the percentage that increased the frequency from pretest to post test. So I use the Qualtrics reporting function to get these really nice, big, pretty tables and graphs. Um, and then for some of the math, we do that in Excel and put it all together in Word, make it a PDF, and then share it with whoever needs to see it. All right, so that um, was a very trip, a very quick trip down the reports function. Um, but again, I guess the take home is, this is just kind of a glimpse uh, into what is possible with Qualtrics. Um, you know, I want to encourage you to just start building stuff and playing in Qualtrics because there really is no, again, I keep saying it, there's no way to kind of mess things up or to break anything. Um, and there's a lot of capabilities in it that you might not know about. Um, and again, a lot of resources online, both Qualtrics' website, as well as numerous YouTube pages. Um, but at the end of the day, if you have any questions, um, Debbie and myself are the folks who are mo most first in it. Uh, I'd put T in that boat too, but T's busy doing other stuff. So if you have um, questions, you please send them to, um, to myself or to Debbie. All right, so we've got a few minutes left. Um, I've been talking nonstop for just about an hour. So if there's any last minute questions, I wanna answer those before we kind of get off. And um, I will stick around past two o'clock if there are folks who wanna hang out and talk more about Qualtrics. Brian, we have a few more that came in in the chat while we were finishing up that last section. Awesome. Um, one, are there any cheat sheet documents that can be printed for future reference? Love it. Um, not that I'm aware of off the top of my head. Um, um, you know, Qualtrics's help page um, and help documents are very, very step by step. So screenshots, very simple to follow. So their official documentation are really the closest thing that I know to cheat sheets. Um, you know, as we move forward um, and as Qualtrics gets used more and more with extension, um, I could envision a, you know, a, a scenario where the LOD team members uh, create, cheat, cre create cheat sheets uh, and create shorter videos about how to do specific functions um, and roll those out that are kind of extension specific. But yeah, as of right now, no real cheat sheets, but there's definitely resources out there that are simple to follow. Um, let's see, next question for the free yeah. text response. Is there a way to group the common words? 
Yeah, good question. Um, you know, I don't know if there is in Qualtrics, um, but you're exactly right. So how you would analyze all that qualitative data would be to, um, to look at it and begin to kind of put it into themes or into buckets, right? Um, so using something like Excel to do that would be pretty simple or something more advanced like in Vivo. Um, so we have folks on staff, maybe most notably Amy Elhadi, um, who are really brilliant at analyzing qualitative data. Um, and so if you were somebody who collected a bunch of open-ended responses and needed help to analyze that data um, and to sort of put it into themes to share, um, then feel free to reach out, not to put her out there, but reach out to Amy Elhadi um, and ask for, for her help. And Brian, the, um, in the graphics in the reports, if, yeah. if it is an open-ended um, yeah. text response, it will, Qualtrics will produce a, a word cloud for you. You now, can do word clouds. That's yeah. not a, a full-fledged text analysis piece that would make Amy E. happy. <laughs> yeah. But it's a quick way to look at the words, right? It's a cool thing. Absolutely. So I don't want to discount word clouds. Um, I think they're lovely to put on like the cover page of your report, right? Yeah. Um, it gives the, it gives the, uh, the reader, it gives the, um, the person getting the report kind of a quick sense of what the themes were around that question. Um, and it takes a couple seconds to do a word cloud. So, uh, yeah, that's a great kind of down and dirty option to get started for sure. Yeah. Um, and I just shared my, uh, my email in the chat box. Um, if, anyone is interested in more, um, not necessarily more advanced or, or just a little bit of information on how to do qualitative uh, work, I can help uh, with that. Yeah, Amy, Amy E and I have uh, worked quite a bit in in vivo, which is the qualitative um, analysis software. Um, if you have any interest, it would be helpful. Those of you who are on this session, just to let us know in the chat box so we could get an idea um, of how many people would be interested in exploring that. Back in the day when I started, we used to do all that by hand, you know, hand coding, but today I've completely switched electronically. I, I had a little bit, like my connection wasn't good um, and I missed what you were saying, T, I'm sorry. Amy E, I, I just told them that you would be glad to do a week-long qualitative analysis program for them. Yep. Yes, definitely. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good, Amy. <laughs> I know she didn't miss a sure. beat, did she? No, I just was. I was just saying that you and I have worked a lot in Invivo, mm -hmm. which is a qualitative analysis software. And if people are interested in that, we could do something around it and just let us know in the chat box if. Um, uh, they're interested and then I just had was telling them how old I was in that I had when I started out we did all that coding by hand but now we do it electronically yeah yes I, I would recommend doing it electronically if you have a lot of data um, and avoiding the hand coding uh, it's kind of well even with with the with the software it's a lot of uh, if you have a lot of data it's, it's time-consuming um, uh, so yeah, I, I, I'll be more than happy to help us to let people to have uh, in vivo, I believe through the university, you get mm -hmm. it for uh, the license for about $50 yeah. um, and it's renewed annually every time in July, I believe you get to renew your, your license. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll be more than happy to, to deliver some training on in vivo. So just write in the chat box oh hey christy you're here hi okay well um we got I one will... more go ahead amy oh so uh okay i i got a message that someone is interested and i said yes sure okay um we have one more question brian it goes back to that nutrition report you were showing where there were yeah. correct answers about the salt and food yeah um are the points assigned within Qualtrics or did you do that later in the Word document? Awesome question. So there are some scoring options in Qualtrics um, that I've not fully explored, um, but they, they do exist. Um, but I do those in Qualtrics. Uh, I do those in Excel. Um, 
because I um, have a, it's the easier, it's easier for me to do it in, in Excel. So I ended up exporting stuff into Excel to look at all the pretests and the post test and I match them all up. So it's already in Excel for me. Um, so I then go through, um, and I'll talk about this on Friday a bit. Um, I, I basically take responses and I convert them into scores, essentially, into numbers, and then uh, add them up. So I'm adding them up, I'm looking for averages, I'm subtracting post-tests, um, pre-tests from post-test scores, and I'm doing a lot of hand manipulation of data. So for me, it's been easier just to export stuff into Excel and score right out of Excel. Um, but yeah, there are some options to have, um, I believe Qualtrics do some of the scoring internally and then um, present those res re results in a report or in, in, a, in an export. So, but yeah, that's been on my to-do list to kind of explore those scoring options. Yeah, I, I just actually, Brian, I just did one that had scoring. I use scoring and cool. um, it's nice. You know, I tend to be like, Brian, I tend to en I end up going to Excel to manipulate and work with the data. But yeah, Quadrics will score. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Those of us who've been doing this, doing this for a while, you know, using SurveyMonkey or older, you know, older things with less capabilities, we just kind of got in the habit of exporting and then doing data manipulation. But there is, yeah, so much, so much in Qualtrics. I mean, Qualtrics can do a hundred times more stuff than we actually even use it for. So it is, it's out there. Um, um, Brian? Yeah. I can you check the chat window? Um, oh, I have at least one question. Data download. Um, before we stop the recording. Yeah. Not Just the downloading data the download. data. Yeah, like yes. exporting it. All right. We're gonna do that Thursday and Friday, but we'll do that real quick. Not not the report. Yeah, the actual Excel. Just yeah. how how they get the Excel file. Cool. Thanks. All right. So let's go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's go. Um, okay, so back to your menu, folks. Um, again, survey, distributions, data, reports. Um, one that we skipped over and haven't even looked at yet is this data analysis tab. So this is where you get like a really quick kind of snapshot of your data, um, number of responses, those kinds of things. So if you ever need to like go into a response and delete it or go into a response and change an answer, um, this is where you would do that. And it's also where you would export your data once my machine gets there. Okay, so, so for example, here are all the responses that got entered for a million hearts. And um, so it's kind of like a table of just each row is someone's responses um, and you can check them out there. But the main button is this uh, export import button right here. So this is the magic one. So we hit that and your first option is export data. It asks you what form you want it in. Uh, we just sort of default to CSV. Um, and then once it's in CSV, you can, you know, it opens up in Excel and you can do stuff and save it as an Excel doc. Oh, here's an option too here. Um, if you want to use the export the text or export the numeric values. Um, so that is, uh, it's up to you. So if you want the actual words that are in the responses, you can do that. Um, but every response item, every choice has uh, like a, a number assigned to it. So one, two, three, four, five, whatever. So you could just get those numbers out if you were gonna do some more advanced analysis with those. All right, there it is. So that is how you export your data to, um, to Excel. Uh, there's a lot of fields, um, a lot of this sort of gobbledygook um, in the first like 20 columns uh, is when they started to take the survey, when they ended the, ended the survey, um, what their IP address is, all that kind of stuff. So, but if you scroll over here, here are all of the responses to all the questions. And then you can start to do um, write formulas and do math and stuff on them. So that helped, Eddie? Yes, which is what we'll be doing on Thursday and Friday. I'll be dealing with registration data on Thursday, and then Brian will be dealing with 
collection um, uh, data on Friday. Exactly. So a lot of a lot of cool Excel shortcuts and tips and tricks. Um, tomorrow, dealing mostly with um, words, so names and addresses and that kind of stuff from Debbie. And then Friday, dealing a bit more with quantitative, um, how to count stuff and how to add stuff up and how to subtract stuff and how to do math summaries. All right. And Debbie, I just wanted to make sure that there was one more a question again about getting the code to up, upgrade to Qualtrics. Yes, I've been trying okay. to furiously monitor the chat box because yeah. there's a lot of private messages. So um, I will be sending those out to the people that have requested them either here or the best way to ask for it is sending me an email. Um, and I'll just type my email address in the box again. All right. Well, for those of you that are still here, thanks for coming. Um, again, way too much information to cover in an hour, but we hope it kind of gave you <laughs> a snapshot of um, kind of the basic ways to use Qualtrics and what's possible um, and kind of encourage you to explore it a bit more, especially in the coming months. Um, it's going to be more important than ever, but um, even beyond that, it's a tool that is uh, super useful. Thanks, so Brian. Have been, Great job. Yeah. I've been having connectivity issues, but Stacy Hicks asked the question earlier about um, the uh, contacts file. I believe it does have to be a CSV. What I usually do is download the example document, and then I just fill in the columns, and then I upload it again. Good, good tip. Yep. All right, should I stop the recording or somebody else? Yeah. All right. Stop recording.